Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome to you all. Nice to see you all this afternoon. Um, welcome to the Tough Decisions webinar. My name is Kate Atkinson. I'm Head of Programmes at Claw Leadership. Um, and we're really pleased to be offering this session today. The first in one of two sessions that's really about supporting organisations through tough decision making at the moment. Just before we start a point of housekeeping, as you can see, uh, we have closed captions available today. So you can either press on the CC button to view those, or there's also a URL in the chat box as well, um, pasted in there to follow them on a separate URL. Um, just, uh, can I ask you all as well to remain on mute throughout the session today? That really helps myself and Keith as we're presenting. As we go, there's gonna be lots of opportunities for you to ask questions. Um, if I can ask you to put them in the chat box and then I will field those to Keith as we go along. If you'd prefer to remain anonymous, you don't have to put your name in the chat as well. That's absolutely fine. And we are recording today's session, so it will be available after uh, this, the end of, of, of the session. So as we know, this last year has been a really, really tricky one for the cultural sector and it's demanded cultural leaders to draw upon every ounce of their leadership skills. And despite pivoting, innovating and, and really putting into place really robust scenario planning structures, we know that for many cultural organisations, sadly, they are now reaching a critical point where they need to make some really, really tough decisions. The Arts Council and other funders have been playing their part in supporting the sector and we know that the decisions around the cultural recovery fund are going to be critical for many organizations so this is where we put today's webinar together really to help organizations who may need to this point forward depending on the outcome of those decisions really face some tough decisions and the how and when and way to to go forward with them so i'm delighted to introduce today's speaker um keith Ara Smith. Keith is Head of Legal Services at Counterculture. He's a qualified solicitor and has worked in law firms in London, Manchester and Sheffield. And he's supported many cultural organisations with uh, legal aspects around gov governance. So I'm going to hand over to Keith now to talk to us about tough decision making. Keith. Thank you, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone. Here we are online to talk about tough decisions. And um, I'm just sorry, we can't all be in the same place at the same time, but at least we've got this wonderful technology to help us today. Um, I am going to ask Kate to keep an eye on the chat and I'm going to ask her to grab any other questions as we go along. So do please put your questions there um, and Kate will kind of curate them for me while I'm concentrating on uh, the, the session. Uh, for today. We've just got over the hour, so plenty of time to go through the detail and to answer all of those questions. If we're talking about things that are a little bit specific about particular examples uh, and we haven't got time to do that, then we'll arrange a chat later on and we're back as part of this series to go through some of the nuts and bolts of the procedures that we're going to be talking about today as well. So lots of opportunities to go through that. Um, lots of things to share. If you've been through similar situations, put that in the chat and Kate will pick that up as well. So I'm going to share my screen just to help pull some bullet points together for everyone. Um, hopefully you can see that at the side of your screen. Um, you'll be able to see uh, hopefully me and the captions as well at the same time and we'll move on from there. Um, I have spent my time as a solicitor working with organisations at times when really complicated decisions are being made. I guess most people don't want to spend their life talking to solicitors, I can't think why, but um, it's, it is about finding that kind of skill and expertise to help people through situations that are unfamiliar and it may be they're unfamiliar because we don't know about the rules or the regulations. It might be unfamiliar because we're dealing with different resources, different funding, different funders, things that aren't quite the run of the mill. Maybe we're looking at new services or ways of delivering those activities and all of those can combine to become a really complicated matrix of elements that become part and parcel of these tough decisions. Um, I have uh, the benefit of working with colleagues who come from very different 
disciplines. And what I've found over the last few years is being able to tap in to different people with different experiences and different backgrounds enables us to talk around problems in a way that's much more open and much more likely to highlight the risks and the rewards of working with clients in particular ways. So it's a kind of model that we've been developing ourselves and we'd like to share a little bit about that with you today. Um, I will talk around specific examples where I'm allowed to. Other things I do are completely confidential. So you'll forgive me, I hope, if I'm being slightly more vague about the people I'm working with at the moment. But here's an example of a really big project. Leeds 2023, it's a citywide arts festival that guess what is happening in Leeds and guess what it's happening in 2023. But what we've had to find is a way of working with the city at a time when making decisions is really difficult. And it's not just because of uh, the pandemic and the lockdowns, it's also about a time of change for the city. It's about to go through a local authority uh, rejig, which will mean that the people who are engaging with the process today may not be the people who are looking after the city and, and the arts culture scene um, by the time we get to 23. So it's finding the right people to make the right decisions at the right time, knowing full well that might need to change as time goes on. At completely the other end of the uh, schemes we've got Kitchen Sink Live, which is a two person arts organisation in Liverpool. And Abby um, is uh, working on a little bit of R&D uh, at the moment, which will go live in a week or two's time. But she's been on furlough for most of the last year and has had to try and find ways of keeping a tiny little organisation going with tiny amounts of resource um, whilst thinking about the opportunities and what might be possible for this year and next. So that there is a level at which these kinds of decisions need to be made depending on the resources, depending on the time constraints that you may be facing in your organisation. The Cultural Governance Alliance has its website with all of its tools and resources available and lots of it recently has been focusing on how do we adapt our decision making processes given where we are with the lockdowns and the handbook includes some templates and policies and procedures that might well be helpful as you're thinking about how to do this in, in, a, in a way that's robust. The Charity Governance Code had a little refresh at December and one of the things that was revised was its section on diversity and inclusion. So if you're not familiar with the guide, and it's not just for charities, it was written for not-for-profit organisations uh, in general, there may well be some headings in there that again helps guide the kind of information and policy decisions that you might be faced with uh, going forward. So wh where do I start? Well, I thought it'd be worth us just saying that not all hard decisions are big decisions. I think we've all had those kind of moments where we're standing in the supermarket trying to see what's on the shelves because you're wearing a mask and your glasses are fogging up and being faced with a choice of 20 different toothpastes or 15 different jams on the shelf and sometimes just the the, the the nature of the choice means that you have to hesitate and then you have to find a way of working out which of the 20 odd types of toothpaste ends up being the one that you purchase. And for that split second, it really is a difficult decision. It's not one that we find easy processing, but it's not a big decision. And it's one that we can walk away from without too many problems, but it's a way of trying to find a, a concept, a way of thinking, a process that's going to be appropriate for the particular decisions that you're facing. And I look back to my life and the kind of big decisions that I've been involved with, 
and some of them were really easy. You know, some of them were taken almost on a split second and somehow my brain found a way of looking at this information and working out what was the best thing to do. Now, when we're working in an organization, that becomes harder because we're working as a part of a team and these kinds of decisions are often taken collectively. But we've then got to try and apply this way of thinking, this way of filtering information into something that's going to work really well uh, in these big scenarios that we're going to be looking at today. The other thing I wanted to touch on is kind of how we're thinking about decisions given what we've just been through over this last year. You know, it has been a hard year and what we need to do is find a way of proceeding that takes that into account. We, we shouldn't forget the lessons we've learned over this last year. And if that means making sure that we are taking more time or we're allowing more resource for a decision that's really tough, that's absolutely fine. I think we've learned that actually flexibility is part and parcel of being prudent. I think lots of arts organisations, and especially their trust boards, kind of got used to taking decisions in a very orderly, very structured, very kind of uh, safe kind of way. And the temptation was always, well, we'll leave it there, we'll consider it further, we'll come back to it. And that felt prudent because it kind of protected the reserves. It didn't launch into something that was brand new without that level of research that we all felt was appropriate. And it may be those levels of research are still appropriate. But I think we've also learned the benefits of being fleet of foot, of being flexible, of, of spending our time listening to what others are doing in the sector and sharing good practice in a way that perhaps we weren't so good at this time last year. So I think there's a little bit around that flexibility that we ought to keep in mind as we're thinking through this process. I say drifters because the temptation then is, well, let's see what happens. You know, we'll drift along and see if we end up in a position that's perfectly acceptable going forward. Uh, you know, and that can also be seen as burying our heads in the sand. And I think that's that's the, the kind of decision process that I'm not a fan of. If, if you have got to be the master of your organization's destiny, and if you've got that kind of link to being involved in the process, I think then stakeholders feel part of it, colleagues feel part of it. We don't get this kind of sense of it's you and us as part of these tough decision making processes. And that I think is helpful. So don't take decisions in a silo, don't hide information under the carpet, but find ways of sharing it as soon as you possibly can to enable the right conversations to happen with the right people at the right time. Which brings us back to, well, what's what can be the framework? How do we know it's going to be the right decision? It doesn't matter so much if I'm choosing between custard creams and bourbons. We all know custard creams are the best, but it doesn't kind of matter if custard creams aren't on the shelf this week, but we are talking about people's lives potentially with tough decisions. We're talking about their careers. We're talking about their income streams. So, you know, these are big ramifications for the kind of decisions that some organizations will be faced with over the next few weeks. So how do we know we've got the right decision? And that's where I come back to working with organisations that have a strong sense of what they are about. They are able to articulate their ethos, their vision of what they are there to achieve. And I think if we can match the decision making process and its result with a future that relates back to that really strong vision that underpins the work, then we're looking at a good result. It might be there's several good results and that's absolutely fine. But if we can link our chosen result back to our vision, 
back to our ethos, then I think we're all going to be comfortable in explaining why we made that decision, how we came to that recommendation in the report at the end of it. So it's going to be a broad brush approach for today, and there's going to be specific things that I'm sure will apply in particular decisions that you are going to be looking at. Um, but before we get into that kind of process, just to say that some rules and regulations have been relaxed because of COVID. And the government pushes out the current status of the COVID rules on their website at .gov UK, and it changes over time. So some of the decision-making processes for organisations are relaxed at least until the end of March. I don't know whether they're going to be renewed for April, or it may be that with lockdowns easing, the government's taken the view that we can return some of these decision-making processes, the calling of meetings, the filing of reports, um, and, and we go back to the standard rules and regulations. But worth checking, because these things do change and they do kind of get updated on a fairly regular basis. So where do we start? Well, for an organisation, if you're a charity, if you're a company, uh, not-for-profit, community interest company, those kinds of organisations that have a corporate body at its heart, then by default, these kind of tough decisions are taken collectively. Which means that a group of people will come together, discuss what needs to be discussed, and will make a decision together, and everyone who are part of that decision-making process will be bound by that collective decision-making. So it is a process which will be binding. And knowing that there will be a point in time when someone will be asked to make that decision can sometimes be a really useful tool. It will enable a timeline to go with that decision-making process. And it will be clear on who is responsible for the outcomes. So by default, it will be the board. It will be the trustees, the directors who are responsible collectively for that decision once it's made. It doesn't have to happen at a meeting with everyone sitting around the same table, although that's absolutely fine as long as we can find safe ways of working in those kinds of spaces. It can also happen by email, it can happen by Zoom conference, it can happen using all of those technologies as long as they are all allowed either under the general rules and regulations of the land or at your particular constitution. So it's worth double checking now while you have time on how those kinds of meetings can take place. Some constitutions have very specific wording around how they can take place and some types of organisations like those with royal charters or cooperative societies have very specific things in their rules and regulations. So check you know what the parameters might be. Once you know you're in the right room making the right decisions, what happens if some people aren't agreeing with a way forward? Well, because it's a collective decision, everyone who's involved with that decision will be bound by it and will be responsible for it. So if, if you are faced with a decision and you are not happy with the way that the discussion has taken place or you're not happy with the end result, you have a choice. You can either be part of that recommendation, that decision, or you have to step back. The way the law works with these kind of corporate made decisions is that if you are part and parcel of it, you, you are responsible for it. If you don't want to be responsible for it, then you must resign. It's not enough to uh, uh, leave the room. It's not enough to vote against it. It's not enough to have your views put into the minutes of the meeting. If that vote is carried, and the decision is made, and you are part of the board at that time, you will be responsible for it. 
and it might mean that uh, things happen that you're not very happy about. But that's 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 kind of the way that these democratic systems work. It may be that you are being asked to make the decision on behalf of one of those bodies. It may be that they want to delegate that decision making process to you. And then you, you need to know that the scope, the terms on which you can make the decision, what kind of resources are available, what, what kind of time scan you're looking at, and how you're going to have a check and balance to make sure that those tough decisions are made properly. So if you are the person delegating, be, be careful and confident on how that delegation process is gonna work. And if you're receiving the delegation, and be clear on what is expected of you. All of that is about managing the risks involved with the decision-making processes and making sure you've got a sense of where that risk lies and how comfortable you are as an individual and as an organization with how that risk is managed. There are gonna be some times, especially if we're looking at disaster scenarios where seeking advice must be the right thing and sometimes the regulators can help if, if, it, if it is going to be fundamental to the running of the organization. So people like the Information Commissioner's Office, if there's a data issue, or the Charity Commission, if there's a charity issue, are, are there to help with these kind of decisions. The Commission will want to know that their involvement is for the good of the sector rather than just trustees disagreeing about a particular issue but but they are responsive they're more responsive than they have been and i've had some really helpful interventions from them for some of our clients sometimes it takes a while so again plan ahead and, and to start that conversation when you've got the time to do it i put record keeping in a highlighted color because the minutes of the meetings, the terms of reference to enable those kind of delegated authorities to be present and correct are all important parts of the record keeping for your organization. And they will be the records that us sneaky lawyers will ask to see if things don't go right. So make sure that as part of this process you are keeping records both personally and for the organization i'm thinking in particular about a presentation that was made at one of the governance now conferences that took place a year or two ago and we talked around the impact of a big decision and and the ramifications of it that might take years to, to be understood properly and the need for those people in the future to be able to look back at the rationale for the decisions that were taken in 2020, 2021. And that's going to be part and parcel of the archive of your organisations and having access to the archive to have a sense of the history and background for these decisions is going to be part and parcel of, of good record keeping good record keeping for good governance. So it, it, it kind of links charity law, company law, and just the practical day-to-day -day operation of an organization in a way that hopefully underpins the decisions that need to be made. Pausing there, Kate, is, it, it, is there anything we can quickly pick up on there before I move on? I suppose, Keith, just looking through the list there, and thinking about some of the items that are, are part of the process. Um, how, how, do, how does a leader check for their organization's decision-making framework? How do they understand what they need to, to weave into the decision-making process? So we, so we start with um, the kind of broad brush position, which is any organization that's operating in England and Wales will need to comply with the law. So it's a really boring one, but it means that there is a process if you are a company. There is a process by default if you are a charity. So we've got that kind of broad, broad prospects. And then we drill down to the particular organisation. And there will be a constitution of, of some shape or form. If it's a company, it's articles 
of association. If it's a CIO, community interest company, um, sorry, CIC, it will be a articles, CIO, community interest organization, it'll be a constitution. But, but there will be something in writing that will set out how formal decisions must be made. And the risk is if you stray away from those kind of frameworks that are set out in a constitution, then the decision itself can be challenged. And that's the last thing we'll want, that actually we go through a, a system and a process, but if it's not one that fits within the framework, the constitution, then it could be challenged later on. So start with the law, down to the constitution, and then from that, there may well be policies and procedures, terms of reference, even job descriptions or role descriptions that might help us work out who needs to be part of any of these tough decisions. Keith, can I just um, uh, interject? There's a question in the chat here specifically. You've just mentioned terms of reference and we've got a question about that. Um, there's a question. Does each decision making or decision meeting rather require a term of reference? Um, it doesn't as long as it is clear why the decision is being made by that group or those people. And it may be that um, a charity board has delegated dealing with financial matters to a subcommittee, to F and GP, finance and general purposes. But that delegation process should be supported by terms of reference. So if a specific group is being set up to deal with a tough decision, I'd expect terms of reference to come down to that group so they understand their remit. But I wouldn't expect it to happen on a case by case, decision by decision basis. That feels like it's a little bit too heavy on the admin side uh, to allow that group to do their job properly. So if you want to delegate, delegate with terms of reference and then allow the team to get on and do it and report back or uh, have that kind of mechanism to make sure it's done properly. But not 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 decision by decision. I think that's going to be micromanagement and, and we haven't got the time or the energy to, to deal with that. OK, thank you. So. Here's what would be expected of an organisation taking into account that kind of guidance and information that comes out of the regulators. And if you follow this kind of framework, then you'll be able to be reassured that that decision making process and its result will be robust. So we start with acting within your powers. And that comes back to that idea of knowing your role, knowing the organization's way of working and making sure that people know what's delegated to them or not. But the constitution will say what the powers of the organization are and what kind of objectives it was set up to achieve. So we, we start with that broad approach that says act within your powers. If you are outside of your powers and you're a charity, then we're looking at potentially personal liability for the trust board, even though the constitution might give reassurance of, of, of other things. If you're outside of the scope of your powers, you are on your own and um, lawyers call that frolicking. So, and, and if you're on a frolic, then you can't be acting on behalf of the organization and you are personally responsible for anything that happens during your frolicking. So key's top tip for today, no frolicking. The next thing is to check that everything that you do is in good faith. You need to have your organization at the heart of your decision-making processes. What you can't do is take information that might give you a personal benefit, might help you or other organizations into this kind of decision process. So acting in good faith have all relevant information to hand might sound simple, but we know that things are moving fast. We know that there are going to be situations where it's difficult to be assured that you've got all the relevant information. It's always tempting to do a little bit more research, to have one or two more conversations with other people. You, at some point, you need to be able to take a view that you've got all the relevant information 
that you need in order to make your decision. And that balance is really hard. There's always the temptation to ask for more, especially if you're on a board that's not used to meeting very often, or it's a board that you're working with people you don't know very well. And it's, it's really hard to get that level right. Um, and some boards I've worked with uh, have so much information that it's impossible for them to take it all in. And others have a very light touch and aren't able to challenge uh, the kind of decisions that are being made because they don't have the background to be able to do so. So it's a delicate balance, but one worth uh, trying to achieve. Um, taking account of all relevant factors is, is that kind of balance process of knowing that you need to know that there may not be just one answer to all of this and, and having some sense of what's gonna be a valuable outcome and how we value the outcome is really important. We all look after organizations that aren't necessarily good at valuing their outputs in money terms. And I think that's, that's where specifically cultural organizations you know, do have difficulty because a lot of the decisions that are being forced on us are financial. And yet some of us are much more used to describing the benefits of what we do with the funding that we receive in ways that are much less tangible. So yeah, knowing where those relevant factors are is going to be an, an important part of the decision-making process. Ignoring the, the rubbish is, is also really, really hard because in the moment, it's hard to distinguish what's relevant and what's irrelevant. But what I'd say as part of the process is make a note of the things that you are discounting to make sure that the record shows all of the options that were considered, not just the one that you decided would be the best. And I think sometimes it's really helpful to see what has been discounted as being something that isn't feasible. And it gives you that kind of sense of the journey that's gone on to get to the right answer. Whereas if the minutes just show that an answer was reached, um, without going through, you always face that kind of buyer's remorse, you know, that kind of sense of, but what if we'd chosen something else? Why didn't we discuss an alternative? But if it's all there in the minutes and you can show that you've gone through that process, I think you'll find that that's going to help, um, especially as you reflect on the decisions that have been made. Conflicts of interest should be fairly standard for us all. We kind of get that sense of making sure that there is a transparency that's involved in good governance and we're making sure that there's no personal benefit that's coming back to the people who are making the decisions. And last, I've suggested check the result is objectively reasonable. It might make absolute sense to the people who are in the room making the decision, but stepping back and testing it to make sure it's also reasonable to, to other people who aren't connected with the detail might well give you a clue on whether it's a good thing to do or not. Um, in the commercial world, it's often a test when people take new ideas to a funder, to a bank. And if the bank says no, then it kind of gives you that second sense of what's going on here and why aren't other people prepared to put a money into a commercial operation. Now, for, for the cultural sector, which might not have that kind of commercial element to it, how do we find a way of having that external objective test to a, to a proposal that you're looking at? And it might be sharing it with colleagues. It might be sharing it with stakeholders. It might be having that full and frank conversation with uh, another advisor, but having tested it, it is really helpful to make sure you've got that external view on it and that's recorded too. Because one of the tests that the Charity Commission as the regulator will ask will be, how do you know that there was this, a reasonably good outcome? And it's all very well you're saying, but we knew that proving it is something a little bit different. So uh, a, a good lawyer will always say, where's the records and make sure that we've got that test uh, embedded in the check and balance process for good governance. 
How about that, Kate? Is, is there anything there we can pick up before I move off? Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll just come to in a moment. But I did wonder, thinking about this decision, uh, does do, does acting within these particular parameters protect you from personal liability if you're a trustee or if you're on the board of an organisation? Does this protect you for, perhaps from action from the Charity Commission or protect you uh, from, from further action? It, it's going to... It is taken from a framework that's produced by the regulators. It fits within the duties that are set out in the Companies Act for company directors and the Charities Act, which is there that sets out the duties for charities and charity trustees. So I can't promise it will give you 100% comfort, but what I can promise you is that if you follow this, you will have got to protect you all of that guidance and recommendations that are set out in in the statutes and in the regulators guidance so i think you'd have to go some way if you're following this to, to then depart from the guidance that's been given by the commission so yeah I, I, that's why i kind of suggest it as a way of thinking through um the, the process because it's it's a simple way of kind of distilling the 20 odd pages of guidance that the commission's produce for us when thinking about these kind of situations. Thank you. Um, taking a question from the chat, um, mm. there's a question here about as a trustee, do you have to resign before a decision is made? So it's difficult. I think this is going back to your earlier point around difficult decision makings and owning those decisions as mm. part of a board of tr trustees. Do you have to, to resign before the decision is made is the question. Yeah, if, if you are a trustee at the time a decision is made, you will be responsible for that decision forever. And it may be that the commission doesn't receive a complaint about the fallout of that decision for years and years and years. And at that point, they may look back to 2021 and say, yes, you were there in the room on that day, you are responsible for it. Despite the fact you might vote against it or abstain or voice your discontent, all of that will be there in the records, but you will be responsible for it unless you resign. That's the only way I can protect you from the ramifications of that decision making process. So, yeah, it's it does come to a crunch point and it does come to that really terrible balance between wanting to do the best for the organisation that you've been involved in. Um, and, and sometimes the best thing you can do is say that that is not the way forward that you're prepared to support and resign. Um, Keith, you've got another question here, which is following on from the, the previous terms of fresh reference question. Um, Lee's just wanting clarification. Would a decision log or record of uh, the, the decision make, make sense? Would that be appropriate? Would that suffice? All of that's really helpful because those kind of logs show that there is a level of process that sits behind what's happening. And I think especially when we're talking about tough decisions, knowing that there is a level of procedure that's being followed can be really helpful and reassuring to people. And let's face it, you know, we're talking about decisions that are quite scary and we don't take every day of the week. So knowing that there is some support from a governance structure it's, it's really helpful and reassuring and knowing it's going to be recorded and there's going to be followed through in a way that can be reviewed and talked about later to see how it's gone. And we can learn from those decisions as, as we go. It's a really fantastic way, way of doing it. And maybe a decision log helps people from reinventing it uh, yeah, in the next meeting or the meeting after because it's there and it's easily accessible as, as a decision log. So, yeah, I think sort of having terms of reference that set out the scope of the work and then a decision log that pulls uh, the things out of the minutes of the meetings on, on action points for you so it's easily accessible to people. It's a fantastic idea. It's about finding the right balance of process and procedure that's going to be helpful. What we don't want to do is go so far down the line that we end up with so much red tape so many documents to look after, so many records and procedures that are scattered around the place that maybe we can or we can't um, in, engage with online, that it becomes a burden. 
and especially for a smaller organization, especially when people are busy, especially when you know some of the team who might be dealing with this is still on furlough. We, we've got to get that balance right. But if we do get it right, it, it will really support you and the organization rather than feeling as though it's another another thing to do, another thing to look after. I guess I, I'd say um, only have these kind of processes in place if you are comfortable that you can follow them. I think it's the worst case scenario when you have a, you decide to have a policy, you have a procedure, you have a decision, and then you don't bother filling in the decision log. In, in a way, that's the worst possible scenario because the commission or another regulator will come in and say, well, you've, you've departed from the policies that you've uh, spent time and energy agreeing to follow. So something must be wrong. So you're kind of on the back foot right from, from the start of that kind of conversation. So find the level that you're comfortable in maintaining. And if it means the kind of things we're talking about today, fantastic. Thanks, Keith. Lovely. Well, taking that in mind, I thought it might be helpful for us to kind of um, put it into some kind of process. And it may be it's something that needs that level of delegation being uh, set out, those kind of decision logs set out, but it may be just a simple way of going through an agenda to make sure you're not missing out a step. So I've called them phases rather than steps because um, they might overlap or it might be that different people are dealing with uh, parts of different phases at the same time and that's absolutely fine. But if, if one or other of these phases um, aren't being looked at, then I think there's there's something that needs to be worked on. So where do we start? Well, I'd, I'd say we need to be clear about the decision that we're making and having that sense of what are the key objectives and can we link it back to the organization's key objectives? And then we have that kind of sense of uh, making sure that it's there at the heart of the organization rather than we're taking it because there happens to be some funding that's sitting over here or we're taking it because uh, you know we know someone who's a friend of ours who'll be able to do something for us over there. So we've got a sense of the key objectives. We've got a sense of how much risk we are prepared to take uh, into account as part of that decision making processes. And it may be you are used to dealing with risk. It might be that you are used to being innovative and taking on new technology and um, moving into new marketplaces on a regular basis. And I suspect then you'll, you'll, you'll be happy with a level of risk that others may not. And you need to also have that kind of sense of control. You know, are you the right people to be making this decision? Have we got delegation in place? So there's a, there's a kind of overriding sense of what is the decision and how does it fit within the organization? We then need to spend some time working out how do we know what is going to be the best decision? Yeah, how, how are we going to have a sense of um, making sure that we, we've got that control over the end results? And some evaluation criteria are going to be really simple because there will be limited resources. There will be limited time. There will be limited money. So, you know, in that kind of sense, some evaluation criteria are going to be simple, but some are going to be harder. You know, is, is it going to be an evaluation criteria about, again, who's going to lose their jobs? You know, is, is it going to be back to that kind of point of principle that we need to embed in the, in, in the structure of this decision making process really, really early on? Or is it more about um, we have two potential ways forward? And how do we compare the two? Custard creams, bourbons. You know, what, what is the difference that's going to make the difference to make sure we know who's the winner? And I think that kind of evaluation tool is going to be quite complicated for complicated decisions. And I think lots of the decisions we feel are complicated are because there isn't a criteria that's easy to pick to evaluate custard creams and bourbons. You know, what, what is going to be the thing that makes the difference? And once we've got a sense of what makes the difference, then we can go on to the next phase, which is about shortlisting the options. And if we've got a set of options to choose from, 
people feel much more comfortable. It's not just we have got to do something, but we've got a choice on what we do. And that choice sometimes is really helpful. Having said that, too much choice, toothpaste tubes on the supermarket shelves, and we grind to a halt. We can't cope with too much choice. So evaluating it down to a set number of shortlisted options can give people the comfort that they're heading in the right direction and that there is a genuine choice on what happens next. The fourth phase is validation. So it's, it's making sure that we build in governance to these decision making processes. How do we have a check and balance that's built into the process before the decision is made? And it might just mean having a five minute tea break during a Zoom call to give people the sense that they've got time to consider the process, the protocols, the, the proposed decision before anyone actually votes. It may be that we decide it's such an important decision, we need expert help, or we need to be able to consult with our stakeholders, or it might be just making sure that we can add up and we haven't missed a sum on the spreadsheet. It's those kind of little points that gives the end result some confidence behind it that we can live with it. And once we've got through all of that, that then it's about deciding if we take this decision, what comes next? And that makes it really practical for people. I think sometimes we get embedded in the process of the decision making and it takes all of our energy and we're so relieved that we've made a decision at the end of the day that then we haven't got that sense of what happens next and who's going to take that decision forward. So I think that's that's why I include it as the last phase to give us that sense of it's got to be practical. We've got to have the resources to deliver that decision and we've got to be able to help people understand how that decision's been made and what happens next. Kate, is there something there I can pick up before we moved on? I guess, well, just looking at it, it's really clear the different phases involved. Why, why do you think it's important to follow a structure like this when making decision making? Um, I think the structure gives people a confidence and, a, and security that they're doing something that has some kind of remit to it that is, that is valuable. I think if you try, if especially if it's a big decision or it's a quick decision, you, you worry that you're going to miss something. And if you're worrying about missing something, then then you know you're not spending your whole energy on the end result. So by just having that kind of simple structure in place that you can tick off, you end up with a decision that is much more robust, and people are much happier knowing that they've they've got there in an orderly fashion. It's, it's the difference between setting off for a journey down to see my parents in Essex with a map in my pocket, regarding of just kind of wandering out the gate thinking, hmm, let's try left. You know, I'll probably get there eventually, especially I've got a, a few custard creams in the back of the car to keep me going. But you know, it's that sense of, if, if we know we've got a set, you know, we, we've done, we've checked the tires, we've got petrol, in the tank or I've charged up my electric batteries. You know, we've got a sense that we've done the prep work, we've got the right tools to make the decision, let's get on with it. Keith, we've got a question in the chat about whether we're going to be sharing the slides. Is that something that we can organise to share so yeah. folks can refer back to this? Brilliant. Of course, yeah, there's a, there's a PDF re ready, to, ready to go with that. Fantastic. And also, if you missed the beginning of the webinar, we are recording this and we will post it on the Claw Leadership website as well. So just to pick that question up too. Fantastic. Thanks, Keith. Uh, and there'll be one or two links uh, to website, uh, the Charity Commission's guidance and things like that, that we'll put in the chat at the end as well. So we'll, we'll make sure we've got all that covered for you. Or if you if you miss the beginning, Kate, you'll have absolutely no idea why I'm talking about custard <laughs> creams, but never mind, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Lovely. I'm so, dodging myself. <laughs> oh, well, we might fall out over that. But that, that phases, steps, they can be as complicated as you need them to be. So that comes back to my point that don't create a system that means that you're spending your whole time developing and checking a system. You know, life's too short for that, resources are too scarce. 
we find a level that suits the type of decision that we're looking at. But if we've got the sense that there's there's security in that system, it may well be helpful. OK. Um, we need to talk finance. And I suggest that because most big decisions have big financial ramifications. And also because for organisations, there are special duties that are connected with looking after the finances of the organisation. So again, some of this kind of just repackages the kind of processes that we've been talking about so far. But this idea of acting in the interests of the organisation, but also of its beneficiaries or the community it serves, that kind of sense that use of the money ought to, ought to bring good to the organisation and the people it works with. And to do that, you need to protect and safeguard its assets. And how you protect it, how you safeguard it, it is going to be up to the organisation. The Charity Commission won't tell you you must do this or you must do that, or at least they won't unless they're appointing managers in, in, in really difficult situations. They, they, they trust you to take those decisions properly because you are under the duty to act with reasonable care and skill. And by that, I mean, you've got to kind of think of these assets that are within the organisation as if they're as if they are your own. You, know, you, you wouldn't necessarily hide you know, your, your, your spare cash in a hole in the ground outside. You know, and we wouldn't expect you to do that with the charities or your organisation's assets either. So you've got to have this sense of being reasonable with the, with, with the decision making. And if you happen to have a specific set of professional skills at your disposal, then you must be a reasonably good professional. So if you're an accountant, then you've got to be a reasonably good accountant when dealing with the organisation's finances. If you haven't got those skills, you're not feeling comfortable, now's the time to ask questions. Now's the time to get some guidance, some advice, some training, or if none of that's in, available within the organisation, then, then seeking external help to make sure that you've got reports and guidance on the table as part of that decision making processes. And as I said before, if you've got a process, follow it. If you've got a report in from a professional, have a very good reason if you're not going to follow that guidance, that report. But at the end of the day, it's going to be um, a decision that needs to be made, a report needs to be written, and then it needs to be followed. So the financial side of it is part and parcel of the overall picture, but it's something that is easier for the, for the regulators to pick up on because you can measure money, you can measure the value of these assets, you can see where it has gone, and therefore you get a sense of the decision making that sits behind it. And I think that's, that gives us the clue on why lots of these regulations actually talk about the financial obligations, the financial duties of the trustees, of the board, of the directors who are tasked with looking after that. Is that OK, Kate? It's, it's kind of an element of the, um, the, the overriding kind of duties uh, when we're looking at the decisions, but make, making sure it works from a money perspective must, must be key. Sure. I was just going to flag um, um, a high profile case around uh, financial decision making was was kids company, um, oh, yeah. which has been back in the news recently. Uh, I just wondered, you know, if you could talk to us a little bit about what was involved in that situation. So just just to recap, kids company was a charity working with young people um, and it uh, it became financially unstable very quickly. And then it ended up being uh, insolvent. And the government appointed an insolvency practitioner called the official receiver to help sort out the organisation and what it should do with its remaining assets, knowing that there were lots and lots of creditors that were, were going to get nothing out of uh, the organisation going forward. And there was a, an argument that said that the board of directors and the chief exec had acted in such a way that they had no handle on the financial decision making of kids company. And that because there was a lack of care on that financial decision making, those individuals should remain responsible 
for the financial state of the organization and they should never be allowed to be a manager or a leader in in an organization going through to the future it was that bad so the recent press was around the court case from the official receiver asking a judge to ban the board and it, the chief exec of the charity from being in a position of responsibility within an organization again. So it, it was hard stuff and it meant personal reputational damage to the individuals, as well as obviously the, the, the damage that had taken place for the organization. But the judge decided that the trustees had taken steps to make sure they were responsible for the finances. And what actually happened was one of these horrible situations with a safeguarding allegation, government funding coming and going and all sorts of other things happening, which meant that it wasn't in the public interest to ban volunteers from being trustees. And actually the judge shut the door on that as an idea. So as we stand at the moment, the kids company board and chief exec have, have been told that they are perfectly proper to, to carry on being in, in a position of responsibility. So a, a useful moment to reflect on the responsibilities of being a board member and the potential issues of what happens if things go terribly wrong. But just to reassure everyone, the number of times where everything goes wrong like that are tiny, absolutely tiny. It's, it's, it's you know, one in very, 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 very tiny number of cases that get to that kind of point. So that, you know, not, not to panic too much about it and to worry too much about that kind of personal liability or personal reputation point. They're very unusual cases. I'm conscious of the time. So sure. um, let, let's just kind of move on to think about once we've kind of had a sense of these tough decisions and how they're made, what could they lead to? And it could be that we're looking at a situation that means that something can happen internally within the organization, uh, which is kind of the, 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 the less radical kind of way forward. And it may mean that there are changes within particular projects or particular activities. Things are delayed or postponed or move through to a different financial year. And that's, that, you know, that, that's perfectly possible and a potentially reasonable decision to take. Um, some organizations during lockdown have decided to, to hibernate, to actually have no activity at all, which I think is okay for a short term. But if it's longer term, you've got to ask yourself, well, how can this be in the best interests of the organization? How could it be in the public interest to just pay for an organization to hibernate. So you know, we've got that kind of tension between short term and long term. Lots of people are looking at business plans at the moment. We know that Arts Council are asking for, for plans to be prepared for the next financial year and beyond. And it may be that new activities, different ways of presenting those activities um, might be a, a better way forward to make better use of resources especially in, in the current times. Some attempted to use the reserves and the restricted funds that have been built up historically within the organisation. And again, that can be absolutely fine. It could be a really good use of that money, which was by design there for a rainy day. So yeah, maybe we are you know, at that rainy day. Just be careful that those restricted funds are being used for the purpose that they were restricted or else we end up with a potential issue where it's a breach of trust because they're being used for other purposes. And be really careful if you're combining forces with a trading arm, a trading company, another element of the group structure that you might be in, because one organisation bailing out another causes real conflicts of interest and really difficult um, conversations that need to be managed properly. Obviously, if resources are scarce, it might be selling off assets, making people redundant, you know, dealing with the resources in those kind of ways, which can be really difficult. But, but maybe the only way through to make sure that that reinvention can take place in an orderly manner. And last, I've said collaborative working, this idea that people in the sector are really good at collaboration. Um, and it may well be that it fits your purposes and the purposes of another organisation 
to join forces. And it might be about sharing expertise. It might be about um, sharing assets and resources or back office functions in a way that makes you more efficient. I suspect most of us have gone down those loops. We've tried some of that because that was the easy, the low hanging fruit uh, that we tried having a go at first, but it's always worth reviewing it to see if actually more, more, more fundamental changes can take place to, to enable those kind of changes to be embedded in the future. If it's not internal, then we're looking externally. And it may be that we take the decision that enough is enough and we have done what we can to fulfill our purpose. And now's the time to step back. And there's absolutely nothing wrong to say that we have come to the end of the life of the organization. There's no rule that says that a charity must go on forever. Um, there's no rule that says a board needs to go on forever. And actually sometimes the, the the right answer is to say we would rather step back to allow others to take on that mantle for the future. So but an orderly shutdown needs to be orderly. It needs that plan and there needs to be that rationale that sits behind it to make sure that there's a clear way forward. It may be that rather than shutting down, there's a way of bringing two or more organisations together and there's a merger of some some shape or form. And mergers, I think, are fairly common in the, in the sector. It may be that activities are handed over rather than big corporate merger type structures take place. And, and I suspect as um, activities start to sort of come back to life, we'll, we'll see more and more mergers being announced as, as an as a economic way forward. But there, all, all of those might lead to a solvent winding up of one or other of the organisations. And if it's solvent, it can be managed, it can be done in a way that uh, enables um, the board to be in control of that process. And it can mean that at the end of it, the records are concluded. But think about the legacy. Wouldn't it be a shame that the archive was lost? Wouldn't it be a shame if no one there was able to renew the domain name that hosted that, that, that archive and all of a sudden that gets lost or even worse, someone picks up the domain name and starts using it for, for, for other purposes that might not fit your, yours. So yeah, there's a little bit of thinking that needs to happen after the winding up. That kind of legacy planning ought to be part of it. There are ways of protecting you if you're not sure that you've got the resources to do an orderly shutdown. It may be you haven't got sufficient reserves anymore, having, having used them up over the lockdown. It may be that all of a sudden there's some unexpected expenditure or funding has been lost. And in those kind of situations, there are ways of protecting the board whilst those decisions are being made, but you have to be really careful at that point. Um, there's a really technical way of dealing with it, with moratoriums and restructuring that, that you have to go down that that really carefully planned um, route in order to have the protection. So be really careful about that. And the last thing we want would be for anyone being accused of, of fraudulent activity or wrongful trading, as in trading knowing that you hadn't got sufficient resources. So that's one why I, I urge utmost caution because um, the, the obligation on you and your organization at that time is to take every step to protect the creditors and that's every step not reasonable steps every step and that's why i say you know, it may be that's the point where having some specific advice from insolvency practitioners and so on it, it is necessary to, to give you that comfort that you're doing things properly so there's there, there's a little bit of technical stuff that sits behind that so to, to kind of bring it all together um how do i handle decisions when i'm working with organizations at this kind of level well, the first is to get a sense of how flexible the organisation is, because if they have one way of doing things and they've been doing that for a very successfully long time, the odds of them being able to change, to develop, to evolve within the time span we have might be at risk. So you know, just be careful about that and have a sense of, of how that can be handled. 
do you have the time, energy and funding to support that change? Because if you haven't got all three, it, it's unlikely to be able to get to the result that you want. And, and yet lots of us uh, are feeling it. You know, we, we have gone through a lot during this year and, and having the energy to support and protect the organisation through that kind of decision making process you know, is, is, is something else. And if you're tired and exhausted at the beginning of the process, you know, that's when mistakes can happen. Look at your constitution, look at your terms of reference, get those changes now rather than waiting for, for too far down the line when it's too late to make those changes. Also know what your funding conditions are, whether they allow you to do what you want to do or start those conversations with the funders now. You might think you've got lots of reserves, but if some of that's box office money that needs to be returned, some of that's funding that needs to be returned if the activities aren't gonna take place, all of a sudden your, your reserves aren't going to look quite so rosy. You have a duty to employees, make sure you know what they are and, and the kind of processes and protocols that are in place for helping employees during a time of change. If things are really serious, then we need to report it to the regulators. There's a serious incident reporting SIR process with the Charity Commission, it's all online, but you will be failing in your duties if you do not go through that reporting process and, and if you lose a major funder that is seen as being a serious incident that must be reported. The report might just say we've lost a serious piece of funding but we've got a plan in order to uh, cope with that and the commission will note it and close the file but it needs to be reported. Um, as I've said really careful decision making around insolvency there are two going concern tests to make sure that you are solvent and you're remaining solvent. And the moment that you, you fail one or either of those tests, you need to be having that specific specialist advice from an insolvency practitioner before you spend any more money because you've got this overriding duty to creditors, the duty to take every step to protect them. If you end up in fraudulent transactions, undervalued transactions, wrongful trade, all these kind of things, that's when personal criticism, personal liability, and potentially in the worst case scenarios, you know, fraud is criminal, and that's, you know, straight to jail, and, and I don't do visiting. So, you know, that, that's what we need to avoid. It may mean that um, we end up with an orderly wind down, which means that we get removed from Companies House and the Charity Commission, or it might mean we are removed from, from, from the registers, but either way that it becomes a public statement of what's happened with the organisations. So in my kind of sense, I remember saying right at the beginning that the, the, the thing we need to do is kind of find a way forward that is transparent, that has that kind of consistency about it. The last thing we want to do is put our heads in the sands and sweep everything underneath the carpet. You know, that's the definition of bad governance, just sweep it under the carpet and pretend it's not there. What we need to do instead for, for good governance is kind of roll out the red carpet to make sense of it. Why am I going on about carpets? Well, you know, we've got to have an acronym at the end of one session, haven't we? So here we go. I've managed to get it all into compliance with the law and with the constitution. You've got to be accountable for the decisions that you're being being made through that delegation process. You've got to be responsive. You've got to be taking decisions when they're needed. They've got to be participatory, as in we're talking to stakeholders, we're talking to beneficiaries, we're talking to funders. Um, efficient, because making too many decisions too many times in a day is very, very tiring. And the last thing we need to be is transparent so that we can justify these decisions uh, for public scrutiny if we need to going on. There you go, Kate. Don't sweep it underneath the carpet. Thanks very much, Keith. Um, just a couple of minutes uh, remaining, but I wanted just to flag for anybody who's attending who may, following the decision around the cultural recovery funding um, in, in, in the days to come, who may feel that they have to make a very critical decision, that CLAW leadership will be offering a, a training session led by Keith on the specifics of how you wind up your organisation and how you do that legally. 
uh, with compliance and also ethically as well. So just to flag that as a session um, that's coming up in April, um, I think my colleague is posting the details of that in the chat. And also a quick signpost towards the crisis management section of the CLAW Leadership website as well, which has got lots of different uh, resources and reflections on leadership, cultural leadership during times of crises. Um, just a quick thank you to all involved in today's webinar, most of all to Keith Arrowsmith. Thank you so much for your insights and wisdom into how to walk through tough decision making. To my colleague Rachel for teching today's session and to Jake, our captioner. Thank you so much for uh, providing the captions today. Um, we'll be still here for a minute or two if there are any follow on questions, just briefly for Keith, although um, just, just for a minute or two. But thank you very much for coming along today. Uh, and attending today's webinar and we hope it's been useful. Thank you very much. Bye.